The base has dropped on a drive time edition of Soccer Down here. It's an overreaction Wednesday. I'm curious to see if there are more over or under or on par reactions after Atlanta United finished with a 1-1 draw last night in San Pedro Sula, Honduras against Motagua. Goals came about 60 seconds apart in the first half, and then both teams had chances to add to it in the second half, but it finishes 1-1. Second leg will be Tuesday in Kennesaw. There are still a few tickets available if you are wanting to get in on this. I think the first leg should be a motivator to come out and see this. You've got two teams that play, I think, approach the game in a different way. Uh, that can lead to some fireworks, that can lead to some friskiness, that can lead to some chippiness. We saw some of all of that in the first leg, but we'll be taking your reactions throughout the show. Mike Conti will join us at 6 o'clock, and to kick things off, we've got John Nelson in a car headed to Athens, Check. and he found his mute button. And he did find it again so you don't go back underwater and okay jared smith yeah i'm here i'm just laughing at john hi dios mio um (laughs) everything feels right with the world yeah everything just feels right yeah that's that's how the show goes sometimes i try not to lose my mind all right Let's start with you, Jarrett, since you're unmuted. Um, what were your thoughts about last night's match? Uh, for me, that's, I mean, you're always going to take a draw on the road in Central America. You find me a team that won't take that every day of the week, especially when you're in a situation where you signed a third-round draft pick to a short-term deal to fill out your bench to have another body in there for the attacking purposes You're missing a lot of guys. You went on the road in a weird environment, hostile environment, more ways than one. The turf played kind of weird. Everybody was kind of uh, up and down emotionally because the officiating was kind of up and down. And you got out of there at 1-1 with some good saves on both ends. And you've got to feel really good knowing that you're going to play in Kennesaw. And I get that it's not the Benz. But you're in a situation now where Matagua has got to come out and fight they're gonna have to come out guns a blazing which if you're atlanta i think you have to like your chances here but that's that right there what we just saw was the kind of performance that i want to see from more mls teams it's not always flashy but it's gritty as hell and it's literally just putting things on the grindstone until there's nothing left but bone because you can't always win with flash especially in Concacaf. you're gonna have to just crawl down in the mud and get down there and fight and just whoever wins is the first one who uh, actually makes it out of the mud still breathing. I mean, there's a difference between these round of 16 matches and the quarterfinals. When you're in this round of 16, you're going to be facing clubs that are smaller, that have uh, a roster that is being paid far less, you know, a roster that is worth far less, but a roster that wants to prove itself in a massive, massive way. So, these games are different for the, the Liga MX teams as well. We saw Cruz Azul struggle in Jamaica. Uh, stoppage time, I mean, I think if they hadn't found a winner in stoppage time, they probably would have just kept playing. playing. They might be playing they would now. Still be playing. Yeah, it's the, the, the flight would have been canceled so they could keep playing. Well, Cruz Azul found a goal, so they didn't have to keep six playing. Six minutes turned into eight. Well, the goal, came, the first goal came, and, and look, I was not watching this game because we were getting ready for hours, but the first goal came, I think it was five minutes of stoppage time that was shown, and that goal came at like 3.45 or so. So from that goal to whenever they kicked off, and I don't know when that was, you're going to add that back in. So I, I don't know if it was as egregious as it appeared. I didn't. I wasn't running clock on it, but... Cruz Azul struggled but found a way to get their win. I would not be surprised to see struggles in these games tonight and in the games on Thursday. So tonight it's Saprissa in Montreal in maybe one of the more evenly matched round of 16 matchups. Uh, also at 8 o'clock, Alianza of El Salvador hosting Tigres. 
10 o'clock tonight, Comunicaciones of Guatemala hosting Club America. And tomorrow, it's the two other MLS teams, San Carlos of Costa Rica hosting NYC, Olympia of Honduras hosting Seattle on the same pitch that Atlanta and Motagua played on. So Seattle and Olympia will probably have learned a few things from this. Don't really try too hard to connect your passes because, well, um, that's kind of difficult when the ball is somehow simultaneously bouncing because of the, the ridges in the field, but also slowing down because of the length of the grass. It's it's a toss up. You really can't play a normal match in that, so you have to make do with it. And Atlanta United found a way to make do with it. Um, before I get your thoughts, John, I, I want to play this one clip from Frank DeBoer after the match last night about that, about building up from the back, and honestly, the inability to build up from the back. Just Go tell ahead. the guys, you know, uh, that, you know, if it's not possible, you know, to build up from behind, you know, then we have to uh, just, you know, play also, we yeah, have fighting football and uh, get a result, you know, uh, either way, you know, it doesn't matter how the result comes together, but uh, that's the most important thing. And, you know, uh, yeah, uh, move the, the difficulty things, you know, more, to that back line and not, you know, try to build up, you know, with uh, difficult things and let them, you know, uh, get uh, the chances. So I think that's why we didn't put that much, uh, much effort in, you know, building up from behind and, uh, yeah, more of a fighting spirit. And uh, it's good to see that we can also do that. And uh, that's why I'm very happy, you know, with uh, this uh, result. But, of course, normally, you know, we wanted to, to explore uh, yeah, our midfielders with Barco, uh, you know, where up front, mm-hmm. but they can go inside and overload the midfield with their quality, but it was almost impossible uh, to do that on this pitch. So the quality of the pitch definitely affected the lineup choices as well. John, when the lineup came out a little bit before 9 o'clock, what did you think about the 11 when it was posted? Obviously, I was drawn to seeing Escobar at left back and Mo on the right. Those were the Let's go backwards because you were okay. not um, omnipotent here. There was no, no posted Franco Escobar at left back or Mo Adams at nope. right back. I'm asking what nope. you thought about when it was posted just with 11 okay. names. No, uh, I had, I mean, you're trying to sit here and think that I had anybody thinks that I had an issue with the lineup, I was cool with it. I mean, I, I was but what obviously... But think it was? That, that's, that's what I'm asking, is I saw, first, everybody had their predictions of the lineup coming in, me included. Nobody had anything close to this. And then I saw when the, the 11 was announced, all kinds of speculation about, well, it's actually 3-4-3. No, nah, it's 4-3-3. No, this guy's here. No, this guy's here. This guy's here. And nobody had this 11 in this configuration. No, I mean, I looked at it, and the, my first reaction was, oh, it's a 3-4-3. So that was what I initially thought when I saw the 11 that were posted. It was it was an interesting one. Um Once we saw it actually get started and and, and once we got a little information for the radio call that Franco Escobar was going to be on the left, we have seen it before. Um, I'm trying to remember the match in MLS where we saw Escobar over on the left, but kind of a similar situation. This one had one extra wrinkle to it, but Franco Escobar was the better defensive outside back that was in the team last night. Brooks Lennon was not 100%, a uh, little bit of an ankle tweak. So Mo Adams got the start. Mo Adams, we've seen him on the left, didn't look as comfortable on the left, and knowing that Matagua wants to attack down the right, and especially pump in crosses from Kevin Lopez, you want your better defender on that side. And I thought Franco Escobar put in a really good performance on that side of the pitch. No doubt. Just, and yeah, go for it, Jared. He's just so damn good defending up the field. I mean, 
if Franco can make the recovery runs because as we've, I think we've established efficiently, you know, Franco's fast as hell, but he defends upfield really well. Like, especially if you're going to get forward in a game like that, where he did sometimes it, it helps to have a guy like that who can kind of cause problems before they get down, you know, 10 yards from the touchline where they're trying to put that cross in, where he's going to have to put it in early and a bit under pressure. And, it helps to have a guy like Franco who defends up the field really aggressively and really efficiently. It's a huge help. And when he gets forward as well, it can kind of make things difficult for the opposition. But Matagua didn't really have a problem coming down that right side with Lopez, with Felix Crisanto overlapping or making the interior run. It was Crisanto's cross to Roberto Morera that opened the scoring, and what a finish from Morera, straight out of the air off the cross. It's a great cross from Crisanto. It's an incredible finish from Morera. John, when that goal goes in at 35-minute mark, and we've seen Atlanta have more of the possession, a couple chances, Matagua had a couple chances. It felt pretty even at that point. What were your thoughts when Matagua found the breakthrough? Well, um, you know, you, you go back a little bit. PT had that free kick chance in the 29th. And that to me was where I thought that the more that Atlanta wasn't getting on the board, that Matagua was growing into the match. And when you see that, it's like, okay, they have officially grown into the match. and You wanted to see how Atlanta United was going to respond, and obviously it took the sum total of, as you've said, 60 seconds for that to go down. But uh, I, I loved your description of the contact with PT and Joseph. Basically, one, two, one, two. How many times did you go one, two, three times? It was one, two, one, two, one, two. And what we saw from PT Martinez and if I remember your call correctly, it was like having a fullback in the SEC and how he just powered through everything there in the, the middle of the pitch and kept his contact with Joseph. And uh, that was what you were looking for in a situation like that, on the road, hostile environment, competition the way that it was. But uh, no, it was 60 seconds later and we're back to square. Okay, so let's go to the goal for Atlanta. And yeah, I, I think Pitti had a different kind of game last night he gets the assist on the goal and frank had an interesting comment about pitty's match last night and what he brought to the table let's play that right now well you know i i cannot blame everybody uh... on the bench and supporting the players and you know I'm really pleased with his uh, his attitude and performance so uh, I'm uh, this was of course you know not a typical game that you expect you know for PD you know you know uh, this kind of type of uh, soccer you know football but uh, um, uh, he worked his bollocks off and uh, for me that's the most important thing right now to get physical you know like 100% uh, they had the advantage uh, on us, uh, Montagua, and we uh, we trying to get there. I have to ask Doug if that was him kind of laughing after Frank said that he worked his bollocks off. <laughs> yes. Next time that Doug is on the show, let's hold, let's hold that moment and see if that was in fact that. Yeah, I, I, I think it was. My money's on Doug with the uh, the laugh there. That was, it's a good description of what Pitti brought to the table. And I think the goal's a prime example. You know, he's running through arm tackles and he, he finds a way to play it through to Joseph. Joseph buries it. And right after you look like you're in trouble, you get the goal to change it. And Jarrett, I mean, that's the sign of a team that is not messing around in this tournament. It's also for me, I mean, we've already seen it from Barco, and we've joked about it, at least I know I have, that Barco's kind of playing with an edge. Like, he's squaring up on people these days. He's ready to go. Um, PT's got that edge as well. You know Joseph plays with the knife between his teeth, as he said. You know what Franco is. You know Rometty's got the Bonfield Bulldog mentality. 
as much as you have that mentality of the the South American players playing this beautiful, fluid game, it's kind of. It, I think it's really easy to forget, especially in MLS, the way the league plays right now, and the way you know we 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 criticize how these really technical players get knocked around and aren't really given the the room and the leeway with the whistle to play their game. Uh, cats out of South and Central America, it just as capable of getting down dirty and really just playing through a really rough game as anyone else. It's not like they played in a, in a glass tea house their entire career. Look at a lot of the leagues these guys came from, and not just, you know, the Argentine Superliga, but, you know, look at where they started out. They know how to play that game. You don't just forget how to play those ugly games. And more importantly for the Atlanta players and the players Atlanta brings in, and we'll see this with uh, Huseto coming in, you know, next week and uh, Castro, when he gets in here, you got guys who are young, but they've got experience and not just in some of those rough and tumble situations, but in big cup situations, they've been on both sides of, of, of upsets. They've been on both sides of blowouts. You're not going to give them a situation that's foreign to them. And I think that really does help in this situation. And as the guys get more comfortable, like PT has, think that it's much easier for them to just kind of say okay that's goal let's go get one of our own and it's not really much of a second thought when he pulls a jasper sanks and runs through the entire defense jasper sanks is the running back you're going to pull out here only for you jason (sighs) (laughs) okay uh i'm just going to go ahead and transition to the numbers that Pitti Martinez put up last night. Uh, three key passes. They were pretty. Three chances created uh, that tied with Omar Elvir as the most in the match. Two shots, two on target. And the thing that jumped out to me the most when I looked back at the numbers, 29 passes for Pitti, 25 successful, 86% passing accuracy. We didn't see those kind of numbers from him last year. It was a little more in matches where he would try stuff, wouldn't come off, it, and which was fine, but he'd be in that like 60% range because he would try more difficult passes. Last night, the occasion called for something different, and, and Pitti gave you something different, and I think that's very, very important. I think when you look at what Pitti Martinez in 2020 is going to be for this team, he looks like a leader. I, these last two matches, the the one at Leones Negros and this one, he looks like a player that is comfortable saying, "Follow me, guys. I, I've got this. We'll, we'll we'll make something happen here." You didn't really see that as much last year from him. It felt like he was trying really hard to do things, but maybe more on his own. Now he's leading a group, and. I love what I'm seeing from Pitti Martinez so far in preseason and in this first CONCACAF Champions League match. I thought it was one of his best Atlanta performances last night. And to your point, real quick, um, about the goal for Matagua and the crosses, because I know a lot of people will get into it, I'm sure a lot of people talked about all of the crosses, like 30 crosses, I think, mm-hmm. for Matagua in that game. I don't know, man. For me, a lot of times it – it felt like the Minnesota game from 2018 where Atlanta played a man down because LGP got a red in like the 25th minute where they had, you know, dollar sign Texas number of crosses, but it, you were kind of okay with that. And you were kind I, of okay I'll tell you why you're okay with that. Pumping crosses and you were okay with that last night with Matagua. 30 crosses. Uh, Elvir was three of nine in terms of good crosses. Uh, Galvalis, who was mostly central, was two of six. Lopez, who Lopez. is their main guy. I mean, Lopez has been one of their best chance creators in league play. Two of 11. Uh, Felix Crisanto had one good cross, and that was the assist. Uh, Izaguirre came in at the end, gave you one good cross out of two attempts, and that's it. So Lopez is the main reason why they had that many crosses, but they only ended up in total with nine of 30 good crosses. Now that nine number is a little high. The, the 30, 
if a team if that's all they got, I'll, I'll take that. The nine, just a little high, just a little bit. But you dealt with them for the most part very, very well, and that goes to credit two players, three players in particular for me. Um, Anton Walks was really good at center back last night. Really liked his performance. Jeff Lorenowitz is a holding midfielder, dealing not as much with crosses, although he dealt with some more of the direct play out of the back from Matagua. And Fernando Meza. Fernando Meza was was excellent last night. I think in terms of just general passing, general distribution, again, leadership. This team had a different feel last night to me. It it you know, maybe it's because of some of the personalities are different. Maybe it's a player like Pitti who is taking on more of a leadership role. Maybe it's a Fernando Meza who's just more of a calming influence on this group. But it felt a little different. They felt like they had maybe a little more resolve. They they didn't they didn't suffer as much. And in matches like this, look, you're going to suffer. You're you're, you're going to be under pressure. You're going to you've got all the adversity going against you. You're you're playing in a pitch that is wonky and weird and you're not used to it and you're trying to figure it out on the fly. You're getting kicked all over the place. The referee is making it up as he goes. It's all kinds of things where we've seen this team crack under pressure at different points over the last three years. Last night, the only real time you saw that was after the yellow card to Joseph Martinez, where I I don't know what the referee was told. We got one replay of it. And it looked like maybe Joseph threw an elbow back to clear some space. I thought the the player made the most of it. But if you feel like he threw an elbow, okay, you could go yellow there. Joseph was was very upset with the call, obviously, and was mockingly clapping at the referee. And this is another one where I, I know I mentioned it on the call. Pitti Martinez came in and intervened and got Joseph away from there because he'd already gotten a yellow and the referee is starting to stare him down for some strange reason. And Pitti comes in and redirects the attention to him. He doesn't have a yellow. He got Joseph kind of out of the line of fire there. That was the only time it felt like, and it wasn't a meltdown, but it's the only time it felt even close to meltdown mode. You know, even Escobar's yellow. Escobar had five fouls. He was probably cruising for a yellow at that point anyway. I thought the way that Atlanta handled the pressure of the match, the adversity of the match, all the weird things in the match, John, I, I thought that Atlanta showed that they're ready for these kinds of crazy things this season. Let me ask it this way, and it can be for both of you here. The words that came to mind when it came to Atlanta United playing last night I don't know if calmer or more controlled is accurate. It's like they they weren't frazzled at any point. They weren't thinking too quickly. They were processing things in front of them in a methodical manner. So I guess maybe methodical would be a word that I would use here. What would you, either calm, controlled, or methodical, which one of those fits the most? Controlled. Methodical is a loaded word. People use it to describe pace of play. Um, controlled. I mean, you you had a game plan coming in. You knew that you didn't want to risk trying to play out of the back and having a turnover. You didn't. You played long a lot. And look, Joseph Martinez isn't going to win a ton of aerial duels in those situations. But you were able to find a way to win the second ball and then create a few chances out of it. And you did. You, you forced Rougier into some saves. But you you had a game plan and you followed it and you didn't let emotions derail it. Controlled is the word for me, Jarrett. Yeah, yeah, controlled. Um, the thing that came to mind for me was coarse, honestly, like like a rough coarse substance. It was just, it was solid. It was just different. It was kind of hard. I guess for me, part of it was unexpected. It was kind of, it was kind of rough and coarse, and not in a bad way, but like played with a bit of an edge and not in the kind of way where 
they played with an edge like we've seen Orlando play with an edge before against Atlanta, where they play with an edge and it goes so far over the damn edge that it turns into hysterics and they lose control of themselves. They played with edge. They had a temper about them. But it, it, aside from that little instance with Joseph at the end of the first half, never felt like they were out of control or they were going to get out of control. It felt more weathered and coarse and callous in a good way for handling this kind of game. Uh, does that translate to next week? I don't know. I have to see. I mean, it's just going to be such a different game. This is going to be such a different environment and might be different selections of players. But the fact that they can go down there and play a game like that with that temperament and everything, to me, that's that says plenty for me. 38 fouls combined in the match. Um, Did 12. not seem to be faced by it, really. Well, it was... 21 to 17 um, in terms of fouls committed. Atlanta committed four more. The second half is where that happened. I think maybe late is where it flipped back. Um, we'll talk about the referee for a minute. I was a little irritated with some of the referee's uh, tactics and I think manage- management of the match. At times, I felt like it got away from him, and it really felt like it got away from him late in the first half before the the Joseph Martinez situation. And that kind of felt like a yellow card that didn't fit where the game had been called at that point. And that kind of kicked it up to another level. I thought the referee struggled with the emotion of the match, maybe more than the teams did. You know, I mean, look, Honduras in this, this is how the Honduran league goes a lot of times it's physical it's a physical league and and you get a lot of physical play so there was nothing out of the ordinary from the way Matagua approached it and the way Atlanta played it to them they it's it's a physical game that's probably what they wanted out of it Atlanta got physical as well and did what they had to do and and didn't back down and both teams, like like you said about Atlanta, I would say the same for Matagua. It didn't feel like they got out of control emotionally at any point in the match. It felt like if anybody kind of lost control of the emotions, it was the referee. And he was constantly like calling a foul and then pushing his arms down to say, calm down, calm down, calm down. And it just looked like the normal chirping you'd see after any calls made. It didn't look like it was going anywhere in a real negative sense. And the the whole situation with like stepping towards Joseph and that I I don't like to see referees do that. It it feels like an instigator kind of move, and referees cannot be described as an instigator. It's just no, that's the worst thing you can have tagged on you. Um, I thought he kind of did the same to Pitti when Pitti tried to defuse the situation. I believe it was Remetti at the halftime whistle. He did the same. It just felt like he lost control of the game a little bit there. You know, the, the end of the second half, it it kind of petered out a bit, so it wasn't quite as complicated for him. 38 fouls is a lot, and especially the way he called the match early where he, he wasn't calling a lot of fouls. It, I don't know if he really, truly had control of the match, but I agree with what the the colonel tweeted at us regarding the referee. Um, A young referee being developed by CONCACAF, um, he said even refs can have a bad game. I think he just lost control of it for a bit. I I don't know how much I'd say he had a bad game. Um, He didn't throw a ton of cards. He didn't throw anybody out. Atlanta United would obviously not like to see Joseph Martinez and Franco Escobar on yellow cards right now, but look, it happens. Franco Escobar getting a yellow is not that shocking. Um, He's a referee who is on the way up. He's a guy who worked the U-17 World Cup last year. He's a guy who's worked everything else CONCACAF has had. He's got to get an opportunity at some point because, uh, to me, it's the, the biggest issue with the game right now is referee development. Because nobody's taking it seriously. No no countries are, are really pushing into referee development in a professional way. None of the confederations are. And the game has improved so much, so fast. It's, it's just such a faster game in general. It's harder for referees to keep up. So it's something that CONCACAF, along with UEFA, along with the Ball along with every country with a major league in the world, they have to put more emphasis on referee development. Because when you get a guy in his first Champions League game like this, 
you run the risk of a referee kind of losing control of the match for a while. This one didn't get really out of control, but it edged that way at times. I, I do think that Meyer Keane, with four fouls committed in the match, um, and probably yep. two or Definitely. three more that weren't called, definitely deserved a yellow and that could have changed the way the game played out a little bit um it's it's not like the referee was a surprise it's not like this was a ref that didn't fit in the world of CONCACAF you know these things happen and I thought both teams probably handled the emotions of the match better than the referee did yeah and for me I was going to get into the I guess the the iniquity of you know, not having a card given to Meyer Keane because of all of the fouling that he had. And that was one of the, the biggest things that I kept writing down on my, the, the legal pad of doom was Meyer Keane, Meyer Keane, Meyer Keane, and then you know, consistent infringement and things like that. So just the iniquity for me was the, the larger concern that I had about how he called it and then bowing up and things like that, which, you know, are somewhat, you, you see that in CONCACAF with officials, you know, regardless of it's if it's their first or their fiftieth, but yeah, for for me the the biggest thing that I kept circling was just the iniquity of calling in cards. Uh, I don't think it was that. I don't think it was that bad because it was two yellows to one. Uh, Felix Crisanto got one, which was a deserved yellow. Uh, it was a slightly harsh call on the tackle where he was coming back and he did get some of the ball, but I thought the way he made the tackle, it ended up in pretty close to a scissor situation around, I think it was Barco's leg. As Barco was breaking through, it might have been Pitti. Um, Crisanto came in and lunged recklessly. Uh, just because he got the ball doesn't bail him out, but you know the yellow, it's the way he tackled it. I didn't have a major problem with it, but yeah, it's a little unlucky. Okay. So two yellows to one, not crazy. 21 fouls to 17, not crazy. It, it's little things. It's it's match management to me that was the bigger problem. But both teams know this going in. You know how a game's going to get called in CONCACAF in this round. You're going to get craziness. You have to keep your heads. And I thought Atlanta, which has been a team, and we've seen it at times, Jarrett, that's lost its head in these situations, didn't really happen last night. No, that's what I was most impressed with is that they kept their head and, um, you know, got the gold and got chances. Raguzan made saves in the second half. You had chances to get another goal to really kind of bury things a bit. But it just kind of went in there and kept your head, played what you knew was going to be a weird physical game. You knew it was going to be kind of quirky in a in an environment that no one was really going to be comfortable in, and I'm okay with all of that. Like, you're going to have to play when you're uncomfortable. You're going to try and make people uncomfortable. you got to know that they're going to try and make you uncomfortable. How you deal with it's going to be key. I thought they did a good job of that. Now, even guys coming off the bench, um, you know, have, Adam John's going to be an interesting cat this year before it's all said and done. Um, you know, you're getting out there and just bringing balls down. In, in you know in an environment I can't imagine like we, it's it's got to be tough enough jumping into an MLS game off the bench where you have to find the flow of a game finding a flow of a game like that I can't I can never decide if it's either, if it's tougher or easier because it's so static at times and the flow can really be there and then it can disappear and you can get 10 minutes where it just seems like it just can never get going again I can I can never decide having not been in that situation whether it's easier or harder to deal with those sorts of games. But, Depends um, on your team. For Atlanta, yeah, it's yeah. far harder to deal with. For Matagua, it's fine because you're a set piece team. You're going to have your best chances off of set pieces. Uh, for Atlanta, who wants to build a rhythm, it's really difficult. But you already were going to have problems building a rhythm because of the pitch. So, did it dramatically change anything for Atlanta? Not really. You kind of knew it was going to be that way going in. Yeah, and then you, I, I like being able to bring in a guy like an Adam John off the bench who can just be. Hey, we need you to be a big body up front, bring the ball down, just, you know, get in there, cause, you know, cause a little bit of havoc. And it's, it's nice to have that. It's going to be nice, uh, be nice to have more bodies for the next, the next game as well back in Kennesaw. And then, you know, as much as they're a set piece team, I think on another, on another given day, 
uh, you feel even better about things for your Atlanta when you can run a Miles Robinson uh, in the future, when you can run a George Campbell out there if you feel more comfortable, where you have more size options to go out there. Um, Jeff Lorenowitz is going to go to his grave underrated in his ability to win the ball in the air because he's not, you know, six foot eight. But Jesus, that he, Jeff Lorenowitz positions himself so well uh, for those for those long for those long direct balls, and just even if he doesn't win them, he makes sure that you're not going to win it in a chance where you can do anything with it. And God bless him for it. Before we start getting into the Twitter timeline, here's a couple more clips from Frank DeBoer last night. First, about the second leg next week. Well, you know that we, you know, play, of course, uh, you know, more. I don't know. No, we can play more, you know, our own style of play, you know, and especially on the on the good surface. Then uh, I'm convinced that we you now play in between lines. Uh, because normally there is a lot of uh, space that we can use against Montagua. Uh, so, but we said already, you know, when it's not possible on this pitch, you know, we have to choose for another method. And uh, so that's why we choose to play more long balls and more the fighting uh, spirit. So for us, uh, so for us, uh, was that the most important thing? But uh, I want to see, of course, uh, uh, United at home that's dominating play attractive football, uh, attacking football, and, uh, yeah, the style that, uh, yeah, we always want to see in, uh, in our uh, home stage. And here's one more from Frank talking about potential players who could play next week that we didn't see last night. Jack Mulraney is back. So, he has his uh, okay. work permit, uh, the visa. Uh, probably maybe also Rosetto because yeah he doesn't have to leave the country so that's uh, uh, okay. maybe a possibility so yeah that are uh, two uh, for us is that uh, great news of course you know that you have like also you know quality you know or in the bench or on the pitch and that we have uh, choices that we can make you know and uh, what I already said this was I didn't have almost any players left so uh, this was the best. Uh, a setup that I could uh, bring uh, against uh, Montagua, but uh, I prefer to have more options. Definitely more options next week, not just in players, but also in style because of the pitch, because of being at home. I'm curious to see how much changes because Matagua's approach, I don't think dramatically changes coming into this. I think they're going to be pretty direct i think they're gonna limit how much they try to play out of the back i think they're gonna be a team that wants to do all the fighting and all the team spirit and all the things that frank talked about that atlanta had to do here i think matagua is going to try to make it that kind of a game atlanta is going to have to kind of be on another level above that and the way you do it is crispness sharpness on the ball and you've got a week to prepare. How do you feel about the second leg, Jarrett, after what we saw, what we saw from Otago, what we saw from Atlanta, knowing that there could be some reinforcements along the way? What do you think about the second leg at this point? I mean, for the second leg, I think you're in good shape if you're Atlanta. Um, you've got to draw on the road, which is what you want in any cup competition like this. They're going to have to play. They're going to have to come at you and they're, they're going to have to come at you and open themselves up. And it's not a team that's, I think, especially on that surface at Fifth Third Bank, it's a solid damn surface um, that everybody knows how to play on and it plays quick. I think it, it fits for Atlanta where, you know, Matagua is going to have to come open and come get goals. They're going to be open for the opportunities to counter and to get hit. And I think some of the balls you look at, you go look at some of the attacks that kind of, it kind of uh, fizzle out for Atlanta last night. I think sometimes, you know, you're just – you've got guys trying to play one-two with a ball on the ground, and it goes five feet, and it just takes a bump and stops because, you know, physics don't really matter, I guess. But I think it plays into what you want to do, and then if you've got guys who can be available for selection, I think you've got options. Um, Luis Fernando was on the bench last night. I mean, I don't know how deep you, you want to bury him on the bench. Um and he may not be your first choice, but a guy like him, if you've got better options, that's fine. 
who can be a technical winger. You've got a Mulraney who can come in late and run at people on the wing if you need to. Having, as you said, I mean, having these players who can come in and play different styles, it certainly helps. I mean, you get late in a situation. Let's say you're up like, you know, two nothing. You bring in a George Campbell and put him in the back and say, hey, they're going to be crossing the ball a lot. I need you to mark up and I need you to just clear balls out left and right. It's going to be interesting. I think the the first goal becomes critical because if Matagua finds one, then you lose the away goal advantage. If Atlanta gets it, then things could get really difficult for Matagua. John, looking ahead to the next week, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think you get back to first goal critical, and I'm looking forward, and I'll be optimistic when it comes to to P1Vs and, and things like that, seeing how uh, Huseto uh, could be a part of things and Mulraney and his speed, knowing full well that uh, we know that Matagua is going to want to work down the right-hand side. Pitch is going to be different. And being as confident as I am, I, I think that uh, they're going to take care of business. I, I think that the lineup up top, obviously, with uh, PB and J, we know what to expect with that. But uh, you might see some healthier folks in the midfield. Obviously, Brooks Lennon being a part of that discussion more than just coming in as a second-half sub, possibly getting a start there. But, uh, no, I'm pretty confident. But, obviously, I reserve the right to take everything from writing it in pen and putting it back in pencil after the first goal gets scored if it's scored in a direction that Atlanta United fans don't like. All right, Thomas Jewin on Twitter to start us off on an overreaction Wednesday. This was from last night. Well, I'll certainly take 1-1 heading home versus Matagua over Cerro Ados heading home against Leon. LAFC, man. Uh, I did not expect to look at the stats and see one shot on target from LAFC. And I think the biggest thing, looking back at the highlights of that one, that 88th minute goal, one, it's just sloppy, but to give that one up after a, a bad goal you give up in the 21st, Tristan Blackman falls down. I mean, it's it's great work from Meneses, but it's a little too easy. Uh, attacking Blackman and Dejan Yakovic, that right side of the LAFC back line that we thought could have some problems. Well, they did. You give up that goal, it didn't get out of hand from there. At 1-0, I think LAFC feels pretty good going back to Bank of California. But you give up the second goal in the 88th minute, and it's a bad one to give up. You're, you didn't really create anything. I don't know how much you guys saw this match. I mean, do you feel like LAFC can put it together in a week and well, a week and a couple days and be more competitive here, Jarrett? Do you think they can do better than they did last night? Offensively, sure. Defensively, eh. Right there with you. That's where my question is. I think if you told me like if you told me LAFC goes out there and drops three goals in that game, I would believe you. And then if you told me that, oh, yeah, they're also going to give up two or three goals, I'd go, yeah, that's about right. Mm -hmm. It just – I don't know if they can go out there and play that way with that back line and not get shredded at least once or twice. Six chances created last night for LAFC. Uh, this is the crazy thing. Four of them came from defenders in Eddie Segura and Diego Palacios – one came from a substitute, Bryce Duke, and Diego Rossi had the other one. That's it. Uh, Carlos yeah. Vela had six shots, none on target, three were blocked. It just ugh, it it didn't look very good from LAFC, and I I do th I do agree. I think their attack. You yeah, you could go find some goals, but I don't know if you can keep Leon off the board. And that would then be an away goal, which puts you yep. even further down. You know, if let's say you are 1 0 going in late in the first half and you give up one to Leon and it's 3 1 on aggregate, 
but you've got to score three in the second half to go through because don't of that away goal. I don't, I don't know if you can open up enough to do that because you have the firepower to, but if you open up to go for it, you're going to give something else up. And then it just gets to be an even deeper hole. I think the second goal that they gave up last night is going to be the one that knocks them out. Ian, and uh, taking your advice, I, I, I found a way to watch the Atlanta United match last night. I did a bit of an end run and okay. watched it and synced up you and, and Mike, and it was about 30 seconds off, so it wasn't too bad. But had the LAFC Lyon match off my left shoulder, so there would be times where there would be a stoppages or slowdowns and things like that, and I'd look off to my left shoulder – Leon double teamed Carlos Vela most of the night. Any anytime the ball was anywhere within arm's reach, two defenders would instantly clamp down on Carlos Vela and make his life very difficult. So the numbers that you told me about his output last night or lack thereof, not a surprise at all. I just don't see I, I would have said three two shootout, four three shootout, something like that. But since it ended up being two nothing Leon, I've got Leon going through. I just don't see and once again, LFC is going to have to open it up and you expose yourself to what happened at the back and uh, Leon gets another, then it gets consistently worse and a deeper grade of uphill climb. I mean, it's like Mont Eagle for them at that point and uh, the brakes on the truck may not work. I think Leon gets at least one and that would mean LAFC needs four. And they're capable but man, I, I just I don't see it. I think the second goal is what ends up knocking them out. Yeah. Uh, Turner Kirby last night on Twitter said only needed a draw tonight, and Atlanta United got it. Responded well after getting punched in the mouth when allowing the opener. Lots of promising signs and lots of concacafing. Hopefully, we get a, the get a same <laughs> result as we did last year at Kennesaw. And then Turner also mentioned uh, my I. I'll go decree because that's how I felt about it, that the era of excuses for MLS is over in yeah. the CONCACAF Champions League. Atlanta United got the result okay. that they needed. LAFC had to try to find excuses for it, and it's just not okay. I, I think what's what's happened in Europe today is a prime example of why it's not okay. Atlanta with a huge win in the first leg, a, a team that everybody was hoping they would get in this round. Like, oh, yeah, we can take care of them. Ah, they're easy, they're easy. Their wage bill is, what, equal to Reading in the championship? Yep, equal to Reading. According to Matteo Benetti of ESPN. So they're spending the same money as Reading, but they're getting results like a Manchester City and a Liverpool. So... I, and I know, I know, the the spending thing, yes, if you can spend more, you're probably going to be more competitive. Well, you have a salary cap, and I don't think you're going to convince Liga MX of implementing a salary cap tomorrow. So how do you bridge that gap? It is possible. We've seen it. Ajax last year in the Champions League, Atalanta slash Reading this year. I mean, it, you can do it. You have to get your scouting right. You have to get your coaching right. You have to have big players show up and give you big performances. And you have to manage situations. And I think Atlanta got all of that right last night because they managed the overall situation. They never let the game get away from them. They give up a goal. They immediately get one back. Their big players stepped up and gave them big nights. I thought the coaching was on point, especially considering the pitch and you had to adjust the way you play. Uh, they hadn't played in a back four. They, they hadn't trained in it until the weekend when they knew this is where they're going to go because of, of Lennon's injury, and this is where you're at. And you get the performance that you need. LAFC, meanwhile, trades their best center back. And I think Zimmerman was their best center back. I think Segura will end up being great but Zimmerman was the most important center back they had, traded him a week before the tournament. They didn't have an answer. They didn't have anybody behind him. And it showed. It showed last night. And you also let Stephen Betashore walk, and you played Tristan Blackman, and he's not Stephen Betashore. It showed. Yes. So 
That's where you're at. And it, there's not an excuse. Those things are not excuses. You should be able to play that match better if you're LAFC. And honestly, I think LAFC might have a larger wage bill than Club Leon anyway. So that argument doesn't even hold water. Depth is a thing. And it's an issue. And we'll get into it because I know there's a few tweets about it. That's a limitation. And that's something, you, again, you have to try to overcome. And you can. Is it harder? Sure. Because you don't have unlimited resources. If you have a, a giant checkbook behind you, you screw up, well, you can fix it. If you don't, you don't screw up. <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, Barbara Price on an overreaction Wednesday tweeted at us and said, happy with the draw and the way we played. Still not sold on the pass it backwards style FDB encourages. We lose too many passes that way. No overreaction on overreaction Wednesday. Um, I, one, I don't know if, if I would say he encourages it. And I don't think he's saying pass it backwards. I, I think sometimes that is what people run with. And I don't think that's the case. He's not saying just pass backwards. He wants them to go forward. He also, though, wants them to go forward in an organized way. And sometimes to get organized, you have to go backwards to bring those players up with the rest of the team. You don't want to create those gaps between the lines. You don't want to create space for the other team to, t- to exploit and to take advantage of. So sometimes it, it really is take a step back, make a pass backwards to then go forwards. And it's, it's, it's an important part of controlling matches. It's not that he's encouraging to pass it backwards. He's encouraging to not give it away cheaply and to be organized. And that's a very important distinction. I mean, it sounds like we're arguing about semantics, but it is an important part of this because, Jared, I mean, we've seen it with teams that either are reckless in the way that they attack or they get sloppy or they get stretched. And that's always, I think, what we point out. When teams get stretched and a giveaway happens, they're in a bad spot. Okay. Everybody left. (laughs) All right. Well, I'll keep going for one more, and then Mike Conti's joining us after the break. Uh, WDE we ready uh, WDE underscore Mitchell tweeted and said just me or did the team there they go look much more comfortable and solid defensively when Lennon came on for Adams yeah it's not just you Mitchell it's it's definitely the case because Lennon's more of a true right back he can sit and defend 1v1 although he didn't have to do too much of that and he's more comfortable going forward than Mo Adams. I thought Mo gave you a good shift. Mo gave you a good shift in an unfamiliar position. In this situation, with the adversity you had, you take it. You take it and you run with it. Lennon is steadier in that position. He's more comfortable in that position. So when you can get him in to finish that game out, you're a little safer, a little more solid, as you say, a little more comfortable. Totally agree with you, Mitchell. That's, that's dead on. Okay. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to get some reinforcements myself and I'm going to go get Mike Conti on the line. Be right back after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. 
This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Hour number two. John and Jarrett's travel issues take them away, but we subtract and we add. Mike Conti is awake. What's up? Where are they traveling? Exactly. Uh, John is going to the Georgia Auburn basketball game tonight in Athens. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it's maybe not quite as big of a deal as it was before Auburn lost over the weekend, but you know, Auburn is still Final Four good, though I must say. Yeah, and Georgia's definitely not. <sighs> one day, one day, one day. Uh, Jared, I have no idea. Okay. Well, hey, uh, uh, no questions asked. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's that's usually the the best course of action. We got a lot of overreaction Wednesday tweets. Um, we'll get to those, but looking back, you know, now I, and I've kind of reflected on it a little bit too in the first hour of the show. Is there anything that kind of jumps out at you as you look back at last night? I just think they did a really good job of seeing the match out. Uh, it, it, that's what sticks out to me the most because. I, honestly, I think I was most concerned about the final 15 or 20 minutes of that match at altitude uh, you know, on a hot, humid night when you can't even fill out your full bench against a team that is uh, nine matches into its league season and is, is in you know good fitness and good form. And, and I, I just was very, very concerned about if Atlanta United's ability was going to, or if Atlanta United was going to have trouble seeing the match out, um, they did a really, really good job of seeing the match out. In fact, I think the final 10 minutes may have been their best 10 minutes of the whole match. Uh, I think that's really encouraging. And I, I think part of it had to do with the, the introduction of Adam John and Brooks Lennon into the match. But I, I think it's more of a testament to, you know, Joseph Martinez, who was dealing with the flu reportedly for much of the week, and, and you know, he still put forth a professional effort. And Barco, who was getting kicked around all night and getting stuck in tackles, and yet he was still providing a, a high work rate at the end of the night. Uh, your back line stayed composed. Guzan made the, the saves that he needed to make. But like I said on the, the postgame show last night, I thought he had really good command of his area. Um, it, it just... I was very, very impressed with the way Atlanta United was able to kind of overcome a stacked deck as far as lack of depth, fitness concerns, and and an opponent and a stadium that's really, really tough to get a result at and, and look better at the end of the match than they did at the start of it. So Nick Braley disagreed with us just a little bit in terms of man of the match. Uh, Nick said, to me, it was a toss-up between Gazan and Escobar for man of the match. I have no problem with Escobar at all. I, I thought Escobar did an extremely good job as a left back, uh, both as a creator. I, I think he started some, some transition for Atlanta United. He had a really good run late in the match that created an opportunity. Uh, and I thought he did a really, really good job dealing with Kevin Lopez, who I think the most threatening that Lopez was all night was pumping in cross after cross after cross that would either go over the end line or over the touch line or, or not find its target. Uh, you know, Escobar, I guess, kind of forcing Lopez into the low percentage crosses. So I have zero 
issue with with Franco Escobar as man of the match. I think you can make a strong argument for Pitti Martinez to be man yeah. of the match. Uh, Mesa and Walks, the center back pairing, did a really, really good job too. So I think that, that that's kind of the fun thing when when you play well and you get a result, and you're having this debate. Oh man, I mean, there's so many different ways we can go for man of the match. That that is a good thing. That's a good problem to have. And I, I think Atlanta United had a lot of players in uncomfortable positions step up last night. And Escobar was certainly one of them. Chris Kilroy is a, a little concerned still, and he tweeted this at us. With respect in January, I tweeted we needed center back depth, and you guys pushed back. This was a super makeshift back line tonight. If Escobar gets a yellow next match, don't say Larry and Campbell are legit center back starters against Club America. Sure, Nashville, but Club America. Well, um, I guess I would start with this was a line of four. Escobar wasn't at center back. Now, that opens up a little bit of a doorway of how you could approach anything going forward when you have injury, yellow card accumulation, what have you. You can go to a line of four, and you've got the different you know types of personnel to handle that, where you can only play two center backs and make it work. I do think you're going to see a good bit of 3-4-3 as well, or 3-5-2, or 3-4-2-1, whatever you want to call it. You're going to see some of that as well, too. When it comes to MLS, and we talked about the end of hour number one, like, MLS teams should be competing better with Mexican teams. It's true. There's just no more excuses. Yes, they have unlimited budgets. Yes, they have unlimited roster sizes. You just have to get your signings right. You don't have as much margin for error. These types of questions is where it's the most difficult because you only have so much money to work with, and you only have so many roster spots to work with, and you have to make decisions and you have to prioritize certain spots. It, you're always going to be stuck somewhere in your team in terms of quality and depth and MLS. That's the hardest thing about it because yeah, exactly. you can't have it, it, overwhelming depth everywhere. No, right. And that's not an Atlanta United problem. That's yeah. not an indictment of Atlanta United. That's an indictment of the league. But let's go back to the concern about center back depth for a second. Uh, if you're worried about club America, I mean, it, it seems awfully speculative to assume that Miles Robinson would not be available in four right. weeks. Uh, now, I mean, maybe he won't be. I don't know. We haven't been told. But it hasn't I mean, been. That, it hasn't come off that way. I, I think no. what, what we've we've heard publicly has been week to week. Yeah, you would think he's back in four. So if it's Miles and Mesa, I'm not worried. No. Uh, if it's Mesa and Walks. I, from what I saw of Anton exactly. Walks last night, I wouldn't be worried about that. Uh, Campbell is young and un- untested on a stage against Club America. I-, I do agree with the tweet there. Yeah. Uh, but by the time you see Club America, I mean, if you're really, really concerned about this, th- there's no reason why Atlanta United could not start George Campbell or give him a chance to play in some form against Cincinnati and Nashville. Right. So, I mean, if you're looking ahead to Club America right now, that's a mistake, I think. And I understand the temptation. I think we were even doing it, too, on the broadcast yeah. last night. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, one of the, the titans in this hemisphere and a, a team against which you have a history and the, the possibility of playing at the Azteco. I, I mean, <laughs> all of that sounds really, really great. It's still a month away. If you even get there, uh, I, I think this is going to sort itself out. I really, really do. You still have, you know, Patrick Nielsen perhaps in your back pocket if you wanted to sign him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Lawrence White, I guess, would be an option. I mean, he it, would. It's not like it's not like you're totally out of options right now. But I, I would not go down the path of speculating on Miles Robinson and his status right now because I, I'm with you, Jason. I, I just don't get the impression that. That this is going to be, a, you know, a month long injury situation. They say week to week, and I believe that. I think if you're looking at playing three center backs, you've got Miles Escobar in a three center back setup, Mesa with Lorenowitz, with Walks, with Campbell as depth. Right, That's six. Now, I mean, now, again, there's only so much wor- you can do. 
Right. Sorry, Jason. You are. I mean, the concern about Escobar put, picking up a second yellow uh, next Tuesday, that's a valid concern. I mean, sure. It's a, but you could go to the line role. of four. That, that, and Absolutely. That's, that's, I think, how you deal with the center back depth. And, and it, it sounds like, OK, you're dodging the question. You're not. You're only, you've only got so much depth, period, to work with. And if you if you feel like you're six deep at center back right now, if you're going to play three center backs, you got six guys who can play there. Even if you're not considering Escobar a true center back option in a line of four, if you don't have him and you don't feel that George Campbell's ready for that game, or you don't feel that you like Jeff Lorenowitz in that spot, you can go to any combination of Mesa Robinson walks for two with a left back and a right back to go with them. And I yeah. think that's how you can cover some of the depth. It's no, it's not perfect. I mean, if you could just spend what you wanted, then you'd go sign 10 center backs if you could, and they'd all be world-class and then you'd have to manage how they all play <laughs> and they're not going to. So, but, but I mean, last stuck. night, last night, Jason, it's an example of not perfect, but still finding a way. Yeah. And, and that's where I think having a manager like Frank DeBoer, is an advantage. Uh, it's creative. <laughs> and, and and having veterans who have been here before, that's an advantage too. You know, it, with, with a good manager and savvy veterans, you can overcome a lot of these issues short term. Now, I mean, if Atlanta United is going to be down to three center backs the entire season, a league season, obviously that is a problem that needs to be addressed. But it's just not that dire right now, I think, as you have outlined. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think you've got a lot of cover right now, and, and I think George Campbell will be a player who needs to earn some trust between now and and that point, and uh, as soon as possible. Because can, can I just yeah. can I just throw one thing in on George Campbell? I haven't seen anything yet that makes me not trust him. No, no, I, mean, I think it's granted, for Frank. I, I think it's just sure. in a big moment. So if he can get a game, if he can get any minutes or a game with Nashville or Cincinnati between now and then that maybe will help Frank feel more comfortable and trust him a little more. No question about it. But, uh, I mean, I know it's a difference between playing Birmingham and Leones Negros and playing Club America, but I am encouraged about George Campbell but because I think he has responded to every challenge he's faced so far. And I thought, you know, that match in Guadalajara eight nights ago was not easy <laughs> against a mm-hmm. team that's not that bad. And, and George Campbell had a good performance. A really good performance. So I get it. I mean, he's 18 and Frank needs to see more. I, I totally understand it, but I am not discouraged at all by what I've seen so far from George Campbell. Yeah, I would agree. Andy Hollums was with us last night on the radio. He was. He said, good job, gentlemen, passing that on to you. Appreciate that. Um, he also asked, which Matagua players impressed you last night? Which do you think would be good MLS players? Ooh, uh, hmm. I li- I like Rubilio Castillo, and maybe not last night because I don't think he was a hundred percent. But I like his game. I think there's a lot of teams that could use a forward like him. Uh, I really like Galvalis too. Elvier, uh, it, yeah, and he was a little bit out of it in the second half. I'm not saying he was a passenger in the match, but but he was taken out of it a little bit in the second half. I think Elvier is a player that could play in MLS. That's um, a good shout, too, because he was one who I didn't expect that kind of performance from him. I, right, I'd yeah. seen him enough and was like, oh, he's okay. He was really good last night. Yeah, I, I, I thought so, too. Solid, mistake-free, uh, but but a little bit pacey uh, and responsible uh, insofar as you know he was not a liability defending uh, and, and he gave you some pace attacking. I, I liked him. He stood out to me. Matag was good. I mean, they, they are easily the best team in Honduras right now. They're good. Uh, Olympia to, will will try to change your mind on Thursday. Well, it, uh, and I understand that, but just looking at their league table right now, sure. I mean that that speaks for itself. Um, you know, and, and let's talk to Surpresa and some of the teams that uh, Matag will feast in in Concacaf League. Uh, about the quality of Matagua. Saprisa really had to scratch and claw and fight to win the CONCACAF League last year. Uh, Matagua made it very, very tough on them. So 
Uh, I, honestly, in comparing what we saw last night to what we saw out of Erdiano last year, I think this year's Matagua is a little bit better than last year's Erdiano, at least at the point that Atlanta United saw him. Erdiano did get better. They really turned their their classeur around after they saw Atlanta United and they sacked their manager. But at, at least at the time we saw them, uh, I, I think Matagua compares very favorably to that that Erdiano team from last year. They're really different. It's it's weird how it played out because at the draw, Matagua was a team that was third in Honduras, and you know Erdiano last year was coming off a league title, feeling great about themselves, and they bring in Ernan Medford, and it's like okay, Erdiano's going big time. And it was not big time for Hernan Medford. <laughs> the Burger King hat did not give him good luck on the touchline. <laughs> and he's gone after the loss in Kennesaw. And then, yeah, they got better. Matagua has gotten better this season. And they're, they're a, a diff, I think, a more difficult challenge. Because they're more physical. They, they do things differently than Atlanta does. The, the way they want to play. They want to be... You know, a physical presence. They want to be strong on set pieces. They they don't want to make the game faster. Erdiano tried to play like Atlanta and couldn't because they didn't have as much talent. Matagua does not want to play like Atlanta, and that right. can be a little bit more of a, a difficult challenge when they're effective in what they're doing. Exactly right. Exactly. It is apples and oranges, but. Again, I think it speaks to just how much better prepared and set up Atlanta United was for last night compared to that, that what was it, a Wednesday or Thursday night down in Costa Rica yep. when they started last season. It, it, I mean, I, I don't think anyone could even remotely argue that, that Atlanta United, as shorthanded as they were, as injured and, uh, you know, as in visa hell as they were last night, they still looked miles more prepared and ready for last night than they did in Costa Rica. All right, we've got a high school soccer update from a, a team we've been following this season. Houston County is, uh, I think, still undefeated. Yeah, they've got to be undefeated because they've scored 45 goals this season and they haven't given one up yet. Uh, they won <laughs> wow. 10 nil tonight. <laughs> and uh, Shelby, a.k.a. Peanut, had another hat trick. Whoa. The Lady 45, Bears are dominant. 45, so they're plus 45 in goals, and they haven't conceded once this yeah. year? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it just for fun, it, test yourself. See what would happen if you concede a goal and see how you respond to that. My goodness. That, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Good for them, yeah. though. Yeah, pretty wild. Uh, they beat uh, Dodge. I don't know Dodge. Dodge County? Is that right? I think there is a Dodge County in Georgia. Let me uh, type that into that the Google machine it. really kick. Yeah, uh, Keith quick. Filer with the, the update for us on that one. Yes, there is a Dodge County in Georgia. There we go. Um, okay. So Dodge County, county seat, has to the improve county a little bit. The county seat is Eastman. Eastman, oh. Georgia. Okay. If their, their girls' soccer program needs to work on the defensive side of the game just a little bit. Yeah, it sounds like they went up against a juggernaut, though. Yeah, yeah, Peanut scoring goals for fun right now. Uh, MLS <laughs> Quay chimes in. Gritty performance by the team last night. Glad the team didn't buckle under pressure and were able to attack. Gazan earned all his coins last night, hoping for a strong performance next week. Gritty's a good way to put it. It is, and, and Guzan definitely earned all his coins, and, and he deserves so much credit for preserving the draw in the second half because he made some big saves. But I think Pitti Martinez and Joseph Martinez also earned their coins for the way that they responded immediately to that Matagua goal. Immediately. Uh, and I wonder how the match would have played out if Atlanta United did not get the equalizer as quickly as they did. It, it's it's counterpunching. Uh, and just as in boxing, in soccer, it's a very necessary uh, tool that you need to have in your tool belt. Uh, it is a tool that some teams that are perceived to be elite in MLS do not have. And I think we saw one of those teams lack the ability to counterpunch last night in Lyon. Uh, so Pitti Martinez and Joseph Martinez deserve a lot of credit, too, because that was uh, that was a goal scored with a clinched fist, to, to use a saying mm -hmm. that, that you've used a couple times, Jason. And it, again, it speaks to 
just from a mental standpoint, how much better prepared Atlanta United was to go through what they went through last night. And quite frankly, the experience of going through CONCACAF and, and the Campiones Cup last year uh, probably helped a great deal. You're used to CONCACAF referees. You're used to the, the kind of chippy grinding style of play that, that tends to unfold in a lot of those matches. And Atlanta United was, was um, you know, capable of responding. But to get that quick response in the 35th minute right after the Matagua goal was vital for Atlanta United because I, I'm not sure if they would have pulled a result in this match uh, if maybe it had gone 5, 10, 15 minutes at 1-0. Atlanta United had some good chances, but the way that Rougier was standing on his head, the Matagua goalkeeper in the second half, uh, you, you got the feeling that it was going to take a moment of extreme individual brilliance to beat him in the second half. They found a way before it got to that point. And yeah, I'm with you. I think that helped the mentality, helped the nerves a little bit. Andrew Baker with a, a big picture MLS question. We've seen uh, a lot of talk out of Argentina. I think a lot of signings are kind of getting done now that will take effect after the Super League season ends the first weekend in March. It uh, looks like the LA Galaxy are going to strengthen their back line. Uh, the Chicago Fire are, are picking up a couple of players from Argentina. And Andrew asks, the amount of Argentines coming or Argentinians coming in, in seems equal parts MLS becoming more free spending slash Argentinian clubs desperate for cash to keep their clubs afloat. I can't imagine the fans of these clubs are super happy with seeing their stars come to MLS. Mexican stars come into MLS, but also Argentines coming in larger numbers to MLS. Yeah, and it, it, I think it brings up more of a referendum on what's going to get you to Europe faster, staying in Argentina yes. or playing in MLS. Um, and, and the economics in Argentina are a part of it, but you know, River and Boca don't really hurt for money in the same way that most of the rest of the first division hurt down there. Am I correct in assuming that? Right, uh, yeah, uh, Boca anyway. River is not quite as cash flush as you might think but they they bring in a lot of revenue they just don't right. they have a lot of expenditures boca brings in a whole lot more revenue than they're spending right now they're the exactly. ones that are really bossing the financial tables in argentina but yet you still have boca selling players to mls yeah um so it I, look, th this is a good. We, I think we were talking about this at breakfast today, Jason. I mean, MLS is in a good spot right now. MLS is in a really, really good spot, and I think part of it goes back to the sale of Miguel Almiron and and what he has been able to do in the Premier League, and how quickly he was able to get to the Premier League uh, based on two years in MLS. Um, Atlanta United again, kind of opening those doors, um, and if, if you're playing in Argentina. And you're you're looking for the quickest possible path to Europe. You look at how heavily Ezekiel Barca was scouted at the the World Cup last year. You look at what's happened to Almiron. You know it, it kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? That that this is the path right now to getting to Europe as quickly as possible, more so than staying in Argentina. It's not to say that you can't stay in Argentina and still go to Europe quickly. Um, but I feel like right now the quality of play in MLS might be, I mean, it's at least comparable, if not maybe a tick ahead from the quality of play in Argentina. It's a different style, obviously. Um, but I think there's more than just economics in play to it, if that makes sense, to address the tweet. I think, you know, it, it is absolutely a testament to the current quality of play in this league in MLS and, and the desires for agents to get their players the biggest possible paycheck as quickly as possible. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Chicago today announced that they added uh, Ignacio Aliceta from Defensa y Justicia in Argentina. And, and that's a prime example. You look at a club of that size, a small club in Argentina, that's first division, but where are you going to get noticed more? playing in Chicago in MLS or playing in a small club in Argentina. It's, it's kind of obvious to me. I mean, he's going to have more of an opportunity to break through here. 
By the way, Chicago is stepping up their social media game big time. Did you see how they announced it today? No, I didn't. They they put out a little. I'm not even going to call it a movie. That that might be incorrect, but like a, an extended GIF of um, you know their fans tweeting at them, begging them to announce the signing, and then uh, you basically pan up from the cell phone to the marquee of the Chicago uh, theater, and it says, "We have signed him." Uh, nice. and, and it was really high quality. It was really, really well done to announce a player signing. So I have to tip my cap to them. And by the way, the fire getting on WGN. I yeah. Mean, that is, that's huge. WGN was without sport. Uh, the Cubs had left them. That's a them. good point. The Black, I forgot about that. The Blackhawks and Bulls had left them. Uh, WGN in Chicago is not the same WGN that we get in Atlanta anymore. Right. Uh, but WGN is doing kind of what Fox is doing as a network, where they're they're basically putting all their eggs in live events. Um, you know, they're going to do, I, I think, a, a three-hour nightly newscast from 7 to 10 p.m., like a primetime news block, and they wanted live sports to supplement that. And in Chicago, if you're on WGN-TV, you're big time. Uh, so I, I think we, we kind of had a hint, Jason, that they were trying to do something pretty big on the broadcast side. That's mm-hmm. a home run for them. Uh, so they're they're two for two this off season, going to Soldier Field and going to WGN, uh, and now they're starting to spend a little more money and, and make some big headline making player signings. So maybe Chicago was the sleeping giant in the Eastern Conference that a year or two from now, as everyone's kind of paying attention to Atlanta, what Miami's going to potentially do. Maybe it's Chicago kind of lurking in the weeds right now because they they've made some really really good moves for their club. Yeah, it took them a while, but Chicago's on the way up. We'll, we'll see where they end up this season and, and going forward. Drew Gano with another overreaction Wednesday tweet, a couple tweets actually, says, while last night was a good enough performance with a cobbled together lineup, the, quote, small roster idea, unquote, will yeah. bite us at some point. Too many international absences this year, and we're already seeing the injuries stack up. Uh, I, I saw this tweet, I think, last night, and with uh, all due respect to Drew, I mean, I, I get where he's going with this, but it's not really a small roster when you add in Hazetu, who's probably going to play now on, on Tuesday, the way mm-hmm. it sounds, mm-hmm. Mulraney, who's probably going to play on Tuesday, the way this all sounds, Castro's going to get here eventually as soon as they can get the visa stuff cleaned up, right. Miles is injured right now, but but it, it doesn't sound like a long-term injury. Same for George Bellow. I mean, so same how for many Edgar names? Castillo. Have a, same for Edgar Castillo. Okay, so that is six names. That's six names right now. You subtract Goodrum, who was on kind of a four-day deal, and mm-hmm. you go from you know sixteen able-bodied players last night to twenty-two in a hurry, and then you're starting to wrestle with, well, how do we get all these guys playing time? Um, yeah. So it. I don't think the roster is as, is as small as it seems right now because the solutions are imminent. The only one that I'm not 100% sure on is Castro because I haven't heard a definite timetable on how long it's going to take to get a visa you know, for someone from Uruguay. I don't know what the, the process is for that and how long that will take. But um, I would push back on Drew's notion that it is a quote-unquote small roster right now. I, I don't feel that way at all. I think you have a roster that can cover a lot of positions. So if it's if it's a small and number roster, it's not a small roster when it comes to a depth chart. And you mm-hmm. have to do that if you're going to go with fewer numbers. But I do think they, they have some questions in regards to those supplemental and, and reserve roster spots. Are there some... You know, more guys like a Lawrence Wyke or somebody with the twos that you want to sign to an MLS deal, like Luis Fernando. You know, is there somebody who might not be competing for regular MLS minutes, but is there if needed in these situations? I think there are some players like that you can go get. So you can add a couple more numbers, but you're not changing the playing time conundrum because that's going to be the issue. I think the other thing, too, and this is very important, you want to have some flexibility going into the summer. I I totally agree. If a need arises, and I feel like we've talked about this quite a bit, 
a need arose in 2018 when Darlington Nagby got hurt in June, and you had that open roster spot, the, the Carlos Carmona spot, and you were able to go out and find Eric Rometty. And boom, you win MLS Cup. Um, it, it's, it's very, very important to give yourself that flexibility because the summer window is going to look a lot different than the window that, that we've just been through. Um, so there, there are some advantages to keeping it at 22 or 23 players before you even get into supplemental reserve development type players, uh, you know, all of that. Uh, I, I, I think you'll, I think Atlanta United is going to be just fine, uh, would, would be the way I would address Drew's tweet. One thing that Drew really liked that, that we really liked last night was Adam John and, and the change he brings to the attack. Yeah, and, and this is something we were talking about with uh, with Tyler and, and Gary, uh, who were doing the TV call last night. Um, it, it, yes, it, it, Atlanta United has not really had a player like this. Uh, Romario Williams had the same type of length as Adam John, but, but was still a different type of player. Yeah, he didn't play uh, in that way. No, and same for Brandon Vasquez. Um I honestly thought Adam John gave Atlanta United not only a, a necessary spark as they were trying to see the match out last night, I was actually really impressed with his work rate defending, uh, or at least dropping back into the midfield and helping out. Uh, and, and look, he's a player with fresh legs coming on in the 80th minute. I mean, I guess you're going to expect him to, to be able to provide that, but uh, Adam John showed me some elements to his game last night that I really didn't know he had. Uh, and, and on top of that, it, you know, I think he's done a fantastic job trying to engage with fans on social media. He's been very active there. I mean, Adam John, I think, is a player that, that unfortunately had kind of the, the misfortune misfortune of being announced as a signing the same day that Julian Gressel left for D.C., and people didn't react very well to that. But I think Adam John is very quickly going to become an extremely popular player in Atlanta, and he took a good step towards that last night. Yeah, I'll agree with that. All right, I'm going to finish it off with you with this one. Jorge B., LAFC decided to stay in L.A. during the preseason, and the team looked flat, and they lost last night. Our front office did an amazing job finding those games against Elfsborg, Birmingham Legion, and especially against Leones Negros, helping the team prepare for the game last night. One thousand percent. And I think we have had those discussions the last couple of years. A, has Atlanta United played enough preseason fixtures? And B, have they played the types of preseason fixtures that are going to adequately prepare them for the start of not just CONCACAF, the league year? Remember, Atlanta United is 0-3 all time in league openers. Uh, and I remember sitting with you in Houston two years ago. We're looking at Houston. They, they had played like seven or eight. Houston Dynamo had played seven or eight preseason friendlies. Atlanta United had played four. Four. Nashville uh, and, and the Carolina and, Challenge Cup. That was it. It, it. Yeah, and they were in Atlanta pretty much the whole time. They went to Charleston for a week and played three matches. They don't look all that great in those three matches. Um, I, I, I thought the Leonis Negros fixture was a brilliant move by Atlanta United. Absolutely brilliant because it put them into the match week timetable. Yes, I know travel is tough and that's a long flight to Guadalajara and it, it, it stinks. I mean, you, you don't want to be away from your family and it is a lot of travel and it can be exhausting. But I, I thought that was just a, a really savvy move by the front office. And the atmosphere last night in San Pedro Sula felt, at least from my perspective, to be very similar to the atmosphere they dealt with in Guadalajara in a similar type of match. And it's like we said, after the Leones Negros match a week ago Tuesday, playing that match is going to make Atlanta United better prepared for CONCACAF. It did. Playing the Birmingham match is another example. Because last year, yeah, they played four preseason fixtures. I think they were all behind closed doors, weren't they? It's yeah, different when you're so. playing in front of a crowd. It's no, they different. played one. They played Peñarol early in front of a crowd. Okay, yes, you're, you're right. But still, I mean, it, it, everything had a different feel to it this mm -hmm. year. Uh, it was a really well-run, well-designed training camp by the front office. Yeah, I think they nailed it. What are you – one thing that you think they need to be better at next week? <sighs> 
Wow, good question. I thought they defended set pieces okay. Um, that that's usually one of my go tos. Um, you know, just I, I think developing that that continuity and that chemistry a little bit better in the final third. It, it's still not fully there yet. It's really really close. And you do you did see it connect once on the the goal uh, with Joseph and Pity combining, but uh, it I still feel like there are some missing links in the final third that that need to be forged. But they're really 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 close, and they're in great position, a really great position. I mean, any win in Kennesaw, which I, I think they should be able to get, I'd be really shocked mm-hmm. if they didn't. And they're going through to the quarterfinals for the second straight year. So I can't really identify anything glaring. I, I do think that the timing in the final third is still just a little bit off, but that you're going to expect that this time of year. Uh, it's not indictment of them at all. Uh, that needs to get a little bit better, but they're really, really close. Yeah, I'm with you. I think being on a better pitch, I think just another week of training, you learn some lessons here. You built some confidence here. I think you'll be in a much better position next week. And if you get – a player like Hosatu into this group, a player like Mulraney with his speed, you can unlock a few more things that can have you take that next step. And that's what? looking at each game. You know, it's it's you want to take a step forward each time out where you're getting better and better and adding more things. Yeah, and you're going to add Castro to that attacking mix as mm-hmm. well, and, and and then it's really going to start to come. It's going to be a little bit of a process, but last night was a really good start. Yeah, it was important. So tomorrow, we're going to have plenty to talk about on stoppage time. It'll be our last Thursday one for a little while. I I think so, yes. Uh, As far as I know, it'll be our last Thursday one for at least a month or two. And then we'll have a special stoppage time live in Nashville. That is correct. I forget the name of the location, but it's. I should have known that all. Tailgate Brewery Music Row. Of course, it is right. That's exactly right. I know it's on Music Row, and I think it's Tailgate (laughs) Brewery or Brewing Tailgate Beer. How about that? Yeah, and it's five to seven Atlanta time, Mm -hmm. four to six Nashville time, uh, a week from Friday. So it's all kind of falling together really, really quickly. But it's going to be a lot of fun here as we ramp up to. that home opener against Cincinnati, which I think is going to be kind of the climax of uh, a long wait to see a match in Atlanta, but we're just about there. Yeah, 100%. Mike, thanks for the time, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. I'll see you tomorrow. All right, Jason. Anytime. See ya. Thanks. We're going to take a quick break, come back and finish off the Twitter timeline right after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apple Linsky and Associates personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience. Supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back 
back. Final segment, Soccer Down here, February 19th, Overreaction Wednesday. I'm flying solo to close this one out. Uh, probably going to close it out just a little early if possible because I'm heading over to State Farm Arena thanks to a good friend Chris Martz with a ticket for AEW tonight. Uh, looking forward to it. I've not been to the new State Farm Arena, so I want to see how different it is in Phillips Arena, but uh, looking forward to seeing AEW live. I've seen WWE live many times. I've seen Impact Wrestling live a few times. Uh, looking forward to seeing AEW. I think Cody Rhodes is in a cage match tonight, so that should be a good time. All right, let's get back to the timeline. Where we left off was with Shiva. I didn't get to watch the match, but the way you and Mike were calling the game, the one thing that seemed impressive was, quote, Atlanta not losing their heads with that ridiculous officiating and being able to close the game, unquote. I hope to see more of that this year. It'll be key in CCL. It, it's 100% key in CONCACAF Champions League. Everything's more intense, and you have to manage that emotion well. And I, I loved Leandro gonzalez Perez as a player, but sometimes uh, things would boil over. And it was contagious. It wasn't just LGP, but when he got going, it would affect others. Last night, it never really got going, so it didn't become a snowball. And it just, you had some reactions to calls that Atlanta didn't like. The the Joseph one's probably the biggest reaction. You had chirping, you had talking, but it didn't get to a point that they were losing their heads. It's a great place to be. I think a player like Fernando Meza helps with that. He's seen it all. He's seen these kinds of things before. Nothing's going to shock him. He's able to lead by example a little bit. And I think help manage these moments a, a little bit maybe better than they have in the past. Ellen Reynolds on Twitter says, A 1-1 draw with no additional injuries feels like a win considering it was the first match of the season played in a foreign country with a thin roster on a lumpy pitch with questionable refereeing and a feverish Joseph. The concacaf was strong in that one. Yeah, Joseph with a fever. I didn't know anything about that until after the, the match when Frank DeBoer was doing a conference call with the media. It's kind of like the playoffs last year where Joseph is a warrior. He's not going to allow you to take him out of a match. <laughs> He's just not. Um, if he can't play, something is seriously wrong. The guy's the epitome of what you want as your your top player, your figurehead. Because, you know, I remember Tata Martino talking about it with Miguel Almiron. When you had a player who worked as hard as Miguel, everybody else is going to work hard too. It's contagious. When you have a guy who's going to play hurt, play sick, uh, play at less than 100%, but give you 100% somehow, nobody's going to take an easy day off. Nobody's going to come into training and say, you know, oh, I'm, I'm tired or my, my stomach hurts a little bit or, you know, I don't feel so good or I've got a little bit of a cough. You're going to go out and you're going to grind because that example has been set by a player like Joseph Martinez. It's, it's huge. It, it's absolutely huge. And when you have both sides of it, the yin and the yang of the calmness now with a Fernando Meza with his presence. I think Mateo Sosetu gives you a calmness in the way he plays. You have that and you have the other side of the warrior mentality, the the, the Joseph Martinez, the Franco Escobar, the Eric Remedis, who's going to fight and fight and fight some more. You've got balance and balance. Balance for me is just the, the key word of the season because if you have that with both of those key elements, you can win trophies. And this is a team that is coming together and heading in that direction, in my opinion. Uh, Alex at Cuppers on Twitter says, this may be an overreaction and hashtag overreaction. Although I miss LGP from what I have seen from Mesa so far and know about Miles, it seems like we will have less dumb yellows from our center backs this year. Yeah, for sure. I mean, 
not all of LGP's yellows were dumb. There, there were some. There were some that he talked himself into a yellow unnecessarily. There were also some yellows that, look, he had to take. Um, that's just part of being a center back. You're going to have to make that foul sometimes. And that's something, honestly, Miles could learn is, is when to, I'm about to get beat. I need to make the foul and make it in the right place at the right time to where it's going to limit the damage. Part of the damage might be a yellow card for you. Make sure it's not going to be a red. Make sure it's not going to give away a penalty. Make sure it's not in a, an area where they have somebody who can hurt you with a free kick. Those are things that LGP was good at. So there are some things that Miles Robinson's going to have to learn, and he can learn from his time playing with Leandro Gonzalez Perez. Meza is just a different player. Meza is, is so much closer to a Michael Parkhurst kind of center back than a Leandro Gonzalez Perez. It, it's just that composure that I think helps a player like Meza be his best and transmit that to the rest of the team. It will be different for sure. And I don't think you'll get as many yellows for dissent out of that group. Definitely for sure. Um, Shiva wanted to throw some credit to the LAFC fans. I'm 100% with Shiva on this. Uh, over 800 went to Mexico. They were loud. They were into it the whole time. They raised money for, I think, 60 orphans in uh in leon to attend the match that's incredible that's that's such a cool thing that their supporters do i think when they travel they try to do things like that in the communities that they visit um do a community service project benefit a local nonprofit. it's an incredible example and, and i love that they do that i love what they did here it's a great representation of what the supporters culture is in major league soccer because some people don't give it any credit and they're missing out. I think LAFC, what's happening here in Atlanta, other supporters groups that do great things both in the stands and off the field, those stories need to continue to be told and amplified uh, when possible. I pity the fool. I'm not going to do the full Mr. T like John does. Uh, I pity the fool on Twitter says, Sure seemed like there were huge tracts of land we were giving up to Matagua on their right side, particularly in the second half, for them to try to cross after cross after not particularly effective cross. Strategery or accident? I think it was strategy. I think it was a little bit of you've hit five really bad crosses in the last 20 minutes. Um, have a sixth have a seventh go have another one go ahead because you didn't want to bring it inside where a combination and you're through and you're in the 18 and you're in front of brad kazan and it's a much more dangerous chance um it wasn't working for matagua down that side one time one way that it was working was when they would try to overlap but if you're giving up that space to lopez there's really the overlap isn't as effective because okay Felix Crisanto can can run around Lopez but if you're not pulling defenders out there in the first place and then running in behind them the overlap's not effective um you kind of took away some of that element of Matagua's game by not over committing to that side once the crossing was not effective um I I do like Kevin Lopez as a player I think he's been effective for them in the season he was not good last night and I think once you started to see, especially his facial expressions, his body language, you knew you could kind of drop off and make sure he doesn't hurt you in a different way. If he's going to keep trying to hit crosses the way he was, have at it. So will will that be the case in Kennesaw? Don't know. I still think the right side is the best side for Matagua. But if you can defend it and take away some of the effectiveness of the overlap or the cut inside like you saw on the goal then the cross coming from Crisanto you'll take your chances with that and if you feel like you can deal with the crosses and you did for the majority of them 30 crosses nine were good they did score one goal from across they had a lot of wasted opportunities from across I will take the lower percentage and you have to get a goal like they did which was a, a spectacular finish and Mo Adams lost his mark that's the element that I worry about on Tuesday. And I don't think Matagua did a good enough job of, of finding Roberto Morera after he flared out to the left. 
he's such an interesting player because he's a second forward in air quotes, but he doesn't really play up next to either Castillo or Klusener. He doesn't play directly behind them, so it's not really truly a 4-4-1-1. He drifts, and last night what he did is he drifted out to the left. I think when you realize that it's Mo Adams playing right back, you want to get over there in his space and, and force him to make some decisions. And you also want to make that late run coming into the back post, like on the goal. I think Atlanta has to be very careful about his movement. And if the crosses are better, that movement can hurt you. But the crosses have to be quality enough first. Uh, Ricky Ricardo on Twitter, if we go with the hypothetical that Mulraney and Hosetu are available like Frank suggested, how does this team come out next week, barring anything unforeseen? So if that's the only two additions, uh, you're not getting Miles Robinson or Edgar Castillo or George Bello. I, you would not get Manuel Castro that quick. If those are the two, hmm, you... You have to make a decision about center back and how you want to play it. Do you want to go to 3-4-3? Three, three? Because you'd have the personnel to do it if you wanted to. You could bring Escobar in. You could play Meza, Walks, and Escobar as your three center backs. You could play Mulraney on the left. You could play Brooks Lennon on the right. Two central midfielders, and that's where you're going to have a tough decision. Uh, I would love to get Hosatu on the field to start, but... If you're not sure if the chemistry is there yet, you're probably going to use Hosatu off the bench. Mulraney would be the one that I think might affect the starting lineup more and the shape more. If you're going to play in a 4-3-3, it's a little bit easier to play Hosatu instead of one of Lorenowitz, Remetti, Heinemann. Play Hosatu as, as a more of a, a true number 10 although he's going to sit deeper because he's he's not exactly a 10. He's he's more of an attack-minded 8, box-to-box midfielder. But that would be a perfect fit in front of two guys who are going to do the defensive work for him because then he's relying on his strengths. It's not quite as much of, okay, he knows the system. He knows the rotations. He knows how the defensive responsibilities fall. In that role, he's much more free. I think it would be Mulraney who might actually allow you to more comfortably go to the 3-4-3, which you've worked in more in the preseason, and Frank talked about that after the match. You started with a four-man back line in training, like really working on it over the weekend before going into this game. You've been working in a 3-4-3 or 3-4-2-1, however you want to term it. Mulraney would give you the ability to do that comfortably if you want to. So we'll see if that's the way they go. But I would love to see if Motagua sits back and plays direct and doesn't try to overextend itself and stretch this game out as long as they can next Tuesday. I would love to see a player like Hosetu come on and be able to break that down or rip a shot from distance and open it up. I think he's a player who could unlock a team like that. Our buddy Gustavo, our amigo in Buenos Aires, uh, chimes in and says, Last night was a typical CONCACAF Champions League game. Locked, harsh, muddy, ref was okay, localist, but quite normal. That's absolutely true. He had chances to allow a PK or slash and show a red card against Atlanta United players. Nothing happened. We never got embarrassed. Our defense left some risky gaps. Midfield at half load. Attack rather diffused. Yeah. I think Gustavo pretty much nails it there. I think the ref just lost control of the emotion of the game more than anything. And I think Meyer Keen was a player who took advantage of it, uh, committed a lot of fouls, very physical in the middle of the field, breaking play up. Those are the types of things that, whether it's it's Meyer Keen with Matagua or Felipe with DC United or you know any kind of player who does that and gets away with it, it has a huge effect in the match. That's why persistent infringement is something that I feel like I, I beat the drum for. I'd like to see referees use it more to free up attacking play. I, I want to see creative play. I want to see you know attack-minded players have the ability to do what they do. I think that's what we all love about the game. And when a team can be cynical and get away with foul after foul after foul after foul in the buildup, it can be frustrating. Uh, Daniel Price on a 
evening commute edition of an overreaction Wednesday. Daniel says, overall thoughts, I'm happy with the overall performance. Shaky at times, which is to be expected, but they went in and got the job done. They have a much more comfortable pathway through to the semifinals, through to the quarterfinals, than previous. LAFC was disappointing. Zimmerman gone baffles me even more now. I, I've, I'm completely with Daniel. I do not think they got enough money to sell Zimmerman when they did. If they had got that deal January 10th, okay, because then you would have had plenty of time to go get a center back and prepare a center back to start at Leon. By doing it a week before that game, yeah, you got a good chunk of allocation money that you can't do anything with at full capacity right now, and you affected your CONCACAF Champions League match. You cannot tell your fans that CONCACAF Champions League means everything. You can't do it if you're LAFC because you sold Walker Zimmerman a week before for a really good return, but not an un just a, a return that you have to take. It was really good. If it had been two million in allocation money, yeah, you gotta take that. And I'm sorry, Concacaf. Yeah, what they got, it's a good trade. But you you canceled your Concacaf Champions League run. I think. Can they turn it around next week? They have the attack to. I just don't think they can keep Leon off the board. And when Leon gets a goal on the road, you're digging a deeper hole. So I think that Zimmerman deal is a statement of the wrong intent for LAFC. And a surprising one. I didn't expect it. Ricky Ricardo says, and this is, this is good, overreaction Wednesday. So disappointed with how this team played. Stars should have stepped up more and gotten it done. Why did they have to get rid of the star center back? Guess it's over before it started. Sheesh, LAFC. But um, bump. Psh. That's excellent. Good work, Ricky Ricardo. I'm impressed. Um, Unite, chop, rise. Uh, g- talking about the referee, going back and forth with the colonel that we talked about in hour number one. The the referee, you know, did a childish thing, allowing his emotions to get in charge. When if you're in the spot where you're arguing and engaging with a player, you've lost it. I, I agree with that totally. I, I think Latin referees are far more willing to allow conversation to them, which I actually like. I think it can be a, a really good way of diffusing a situation. But it didn't stay there for Escobedo last night because he got agitated. If you're going to let you give the yellow to Joseph Martinez, it's the first yellow of the game, it did feel out of place. I, from the one replay that I saw, I do see how they would think that Joseph threw an elbow back intentionally and caught the player. I don't know how severe it was, but I at least see the basis for the yellow card. Okay, even that, you've let a lot of stuff go at that point in the match. You throw a yellow there. You throw a yellow against the forward who's been manhandled all night. He's angry, and yes, he's acting out. Why are you stepping to him in an aggressive way and engaging him? That's the word that Unite Chop Rise used that I really like. Referees can't do that. Let him get it out of his system. Let him clap at you. Let him complain. He it, it didn't go over the top. Stand there, stare him down, and say, that's enough. We're moving on. Play. You can't engage and argue. And, and it felt like it was getting to that point for a minute. That's, that's a young referee, and that might be all that is. Uh, Shiva with a good point. I think Atlanta's goal yesterday was an example of don't think too much, just let your instincts and talent take over type of goal. I mean, it was three wall passes. Since it's a Wednesday, it feels appropriate. Three wall passes between Pitti Martinez and Joseph Martinez leading to the shot for Joseph leading to the goal. Pretty sweet. Uh, Matt Wagner says, I thought given all the circumstances that could have gone against Atlanta United that the team played well. For the one goal scored by Matagua, did you see any specific error on Atlanta's part that led to the goal? Mo Adams lost the mark. And it was good movement from Roberto Morera. It was crafty from a veteran. But Mo Adams has to pick him up. 
because he drifted out into Mo Adams' space. Mo Adams did not stay with him on the cross. And it was it was too easy. It was still really well finished, but he had a clean look. You've got to get a body in there. You've got to put pressure on him. Mo lost his focus in a very important time. He's not a right back. That that gives him a little bit of slack here, but that's the breakdown for me, specifically that. Um, and go back the other way. It started with Mo and Heinemann losing the ball where they did. It was a, a kind of slow buildup. I mean, Mo Adams had recovered by that point, but you were kind of pulled apart a little bit, and the space was there for Matagua to attack down the right, and they took advantage with their best cross of the night. Uh, Tafka asks, when does the yellow card accumulation reset in CONCACAF Champions League? Uh, let's make sure of this. I don't want to lead you all down the wrong path. Um, one second. I believe it is going into the semifinal, uh, but I want to check that it's not coming out of the semifinal. So they have finally... Um, about a week and a half ago, posted their regulations of the tournament. So all the rules of the tournament, and it's on the CONCACAF website, um, pretty easy to track down. So let's go to page 42. The scrolling's not as cool in an audio sense. Um, protests. Well, we're not going to protest anything, hopefully. Uh, ooh, here we go. Any player who accumulates two single yellow cards in two different matches in capital V, capital competition, I like it, is suspended for the following match. Uh, 24.4. All single yellow cards will be eliminated after the completion of the semifinal round. So, after the second leg of the semifinal is where it's wiped clean. So you can't have a second yellow in the competition in the first leg of the final make you sit for the second leg of the final. That's the only spot where it's affected. Um, I don't like the two yellow cards for accumulation. I think it's too few. I think it needs to be three. Um, I do not like the way CONCACAF does it. I hope that they address this because now, I mean, you're in a situation, I think Joseph Martinez is... Uh, a far safer bet to get through without another yellow card. Franco Escobar is going to pick up another yellow card. You really hope it's not next week. And y you're not in a position where you could sit him to make sure that he doesn't. Because you do not want to miss Franco Escobar for the first leg of Club America. Once you get into the series, look, if he gets a yellow card against Club America in the first leg and he sits the second, that's just life. And it is what it is. Can't say you'd be surprised if he got a yellow card accumulation by that stage. But you don't want him to miss the first leg. You, you can't have him miss the first leg. So he's got to be really careful on Tuesday. And Joseph has to keep this in mind now. You know, he, he's got to be careful. Celebrations, can't take the shirt off. Don't happen. Nope. Like, tape that thing down. Don't let him take it off. If if Pitti Martinez has to come bail him out again, because Pitti came over and and got the referee's attention away from Joseph when, when he was clapping at him. If Pitti has to come over and, and make sure he doesn't pull that shirt off, uh, Pitti, it's on you, buddy. <laughs> make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, Kefsi chimes in as we're wrapping up. Not sure if you said it, but yeah, Vela got booed. I kind of thought he would. It was nice to see the interaction between fans before the game, though. LA looked like it was there for them, and it's not crazy to think they can net too. But wow... Right back was a need in lots of games. Glad Franco is ours when he's not the left back. That's a good point. Uh, Tristan Blackman, I think, will be okay, but he's he's not a steady hand like Stephen Betashore right now. I think he'll end up being a good one. I also just uh, he, I I don't like Dejan Yakovic starting these games. He's he's nowhere near the level you need in Concacaf Champions League to get it done, and it's gonna hurt him. It's just, it's going to hurt him. Uh, last one before we go. Four card Ahmed said, love the new nickname for the front trident, PB and J. Yeah, I figured I'd go ahead and drop that. It, it's kind of funny, and I'll I'll pull the curtain back. Uh, Siempre United posted it in a question about asking what the total of goals 
from PB and J, Pitty, Barco, and Joseph, would be in the season, and and people were chiming in. Uh, probably a month ago, Santa United through, and I think they Santa United, and I don't know, it might have been Mrs. Claus, threw a tweet out there asking about a nickname for that group, and I sent either Santa or Mrs. Claus. I believe it was Mrs. Claus because I think Mrs. Claus is a little more active on the social media. I sent a message and said, well, P, B, J, you know, if you want to play off of that, you could do it. And I think, I think Santa United's used it a little bit. Sampra United's used it a little bit. And I, I, I think the reaction is good. I think it's peanut butter and jelly time. I do. Uh, if they play like they did and combine like they did and, and Barco didn't get into the mix that time, uh, last night, but I think that trio is going to be special. And if, if it's peanut butter and jelly time, it's peanut butter and jelly time. I don't know if, if those guys like peanut butter and jelly. I don't know if they've really had peanut butter and jelly. Um, that would be an interesting question as to what kind of jelly they would put on their peanut butter sandwich if they were to have a peanut butter sandwich. And would they cut the crust off? And do they cut it in half or do they just fold over a piece of bread? How do they do their peanut butter and jelly? What would PB&J's PB&J be? That's what I'm going to leave you with tonight on Wednesday, February 19th. I'm off to see some wrestling. We'll be back in the morning for SDH on a Thursday Thoughts edition. We'll get caught up on all the news and rumors, CONCACAF action from tonight, all kinds of things to talk about in the morning. Thanks, y'all, for listening. We had a ton of people listening to the game last night. A lot of people tweeting at us late at night. That was awesome. Thank you so much for all the support. Uh, Thanks for listening to Soccer Down here, and hopefully you'll be listening in the morning. Mucha plata, y'all.